Hello, my previous two videos in this playlist illustrated consecutively three different durations which are different in definition but not so different in substance. That's the effective duration, the Macaulay duration, and the modified duration. But I'm following Bruce Tuckman chapter four, so I used his examples with the sort of messing numbers. So this video, as quickly as possible, I just wanted to compare each of the three durations, so we're clear on the difference, using my simple example with round inputs of a three-year bond. So my simple example is a three-year bond. That's a bond with three years to maturity. You can see the term is three years here. Base value of 100. My coupon rate selected as an input here in yellow is 4% per annum, but payable semi-annually. So every six months, there's a $2 coupon because that's half of 4% times 100. Then also selected here as an input is the yield, that's yield to maturity, of 5% per annum, but that's with semi-annual compound frequency to match the frequency of the cash flows. Now, because the coupon rate is less than the yield, we know to expect a discounted bond price. What I mean is that the price needs to be less than par, which it is, and it is just shy of $97.25. That's the theoretical bond price, which is the sum of the present value of all the bond's cash flows. So here, this $97.25 is the sum of the present value cash flow stream. Each, pre each present value cash flow is simply the future cash flow discounted, you can see here in this case, with semi-annual compound frequency. So we have the bond's price. And then first here, I just compute the Macaulay duration, which has a simple definition. The Macaulay duration is the bond's weighted average maturity. And the weights are in this column here. The weights are each cash flows present value divided by the bond's price. And the bond's price, of course, is the sum of all the cash flows, so the weights need to sum to 100. So this first cash flow here, it's the present value of this first coupon cash flow divided by the bond's price. So in present value terms, the first cash flow of the six cash flow vertices is about 2%. And the weight of the second coupon is about 2% as well. And for a vanilla bond like this, we'll have low weights until we get to the final cash flow. The present value of that cash flow as a percent of the bond's price is most of the weight, in this case, 90%. And so that's the weights that inform the definition of the Macaulay duration, which is the bond's weighted average maturity. And so we have here maturity times weight. You can see my notation term times weight, T times W, right? It's a simple product. Each row, term times weight. If we sum these, we get the bonds weighted average maturity. For my bond here, it's about 2.85 years. The unit here, the units here is years. And you hopefully you know, this is key for exams, what happens if I make this a zero coupon bond is I get a Macaulay duration of three years equal to the bond's maturity. Whenever the bond has, whenever it's a zero coupon bond, the Macaulay duration is equal to the bond's maturity. And hopefully that is intuitive given that we've defined the Macaulay duration as the bond's weighted average maturity. The only cash flow in a zero coupon bond is the final return of the principal. So it has 100% of the weight. So it's weighted average maturity must be three years. So I go back. Analytically, we get from the Macaulay duration to the modified duration with this formula here. I'll use regular D just for modified duration because the modified duration is the true duration that we should use as a measure of interest rate risk or interest rate sensitivity. So when we're trying to approximate the impact on the bond's price given a shock to the yield, then we want to use the modified duration, not the Macaulay duration. So to get the modified duration, we take the Macaulay duration and we divide by 1 plus the yield divided by K, the number of periods per year that we are compounding. Right, The modified duration is concerned with an impact on the current value, which is a present value, so it's incorporating the effect of compounding. And so in this case, K equals two. And so in any case where the yield is with discrete compounding, you can see we're going to have a 
non-negative k and a modified duration that will be slightly less than the Macaulay duration. And that's what we have here. You can see for my modified duration, I'm taking the 2.85 years, which is the bond's weighted average maturity, aka Macaulay duration, and dividing by one plus the yield of 5% itself divided by two because there are two compound periods per year. Effectively, I'm adjusting the Macaulay duration to account for the effect of compounding on the bond's present value. And I get an answer that is also denoted in years. Okay, not everyone, not everyone uh, actually quite gets that. So, but this is also 2.78 years for the modified duration, our true measure of interest rate risk. And so that's the one we use in practice when we say, if there is a change in the yield of, say, plus 1%, then our modified duration of 2.78 years is telling us that we estimate an approximate change in the price of negative 2.78% approximately. Right, so that's how we end up using the modified duration, right? It's a the estimated change in the bond's price in percentage terms, right, is equal to the duration multiplied by, or negative duration multiplied by the change in yield. And emphasis on this approximation, approximately two, because with duration, we're all, it's only a linear approximation. It's not accounting for convexity. Okay, so that's Mac and Mo modified duration and then effective duration. Now, what's that? Well, we wouldn't need it now. In this case of a vanilla bond, we don't need the effective duration because we've already solved for the modified duration, which is the true measure of interest rate sensitivity. We use the effective duration if we don't have easy access to or convenient access analytically to the modified duration. So we use it in really non-vanilla bond situations or complex portfolios because the point of the effective duration is to approximate the modified duration. We've solved for it here exactly so we don't currently need it, but in a mortgage-backed security or a situation where there's some a really non-smooth price yield function or negative convexity, we would need to resort to the effective duration effectively, pun intended, as an estimate of the modified duration. And so we have the formula here for the effective duration. I've covered that in, pre in two videos previously in this uh, playlist. And so it's given its formula is given here, where I like to remind that this ratio here is the slope of that, uh, of the slope of that uh, secant line, and therefore the dollar duration. It's the slope of the secant line that's approximating the slope of the tangent line, which is the bond's true dollar duration. So what we really have here is slope, and then uh, mul multiplied by uh, negative one over price, or if you like, divided by negative price. And so we're uh, simulating or shocking the yield to reprice the bond to estimate the dollar duration. And so I've done that here with a yield shock of 20 basis points, which can be changed, uh, which, I, which is just up to me to select. And so you can see we have here at 5%, the bond's price of $97.25. And then we shock the yield in each direction by this really arbitrary amount, but we ideally want it to be a small amount because we want a secant that's pretty close to the tangent. So actually smaller is better here. The smaller this is, the more accurate this is. So all I've done in this case with Excel is use the present value function to uh, reprice. So you can see how this is more of a simulation based approach as a means to approximate the exact modified duration. And so if we shock the yield down by 20 basis points, then you can see the price of the bond goes up. If we shock the yield up by 20 basis points, the price of the bond goes down. So having performed this repricing of the bond based on shocking the yield, we can now then implement, here you can see the effective duration. And I'll just rekey that, right? I'll say in the numerator, I want uh, price, price with a yield, uh, 
if when the yield goes up minus price when the yield goes down and I'll divide that by 2 times the yield shock right because which is the same as the difference between 5.2 and 4.8 so that denominator's 40 basis points and that's just consistency right I'm taking the difference between two prices that differ w differ in by the in terms of the yield by 40 basis points so my denominator needs to be consistent and then I just want to multiply by one or a, a negative one divided by the bonds price here and I get the effective duration of 2.7 2, uh, 2.785 years you can see it's so close but if I took these out if I took the uh, decimal formatting out at some point, the discrepancy here would be revealed, and we would uh, uh, we would see that the effective duration is approximating this modified duration. And so that's great. We can use either the 2.785 years. We can use either for purposes of estimating a yield, a, a, sh a parallel shock to the yield curve on our bond's price, and uh, it's fine. But it's fine to use the effective duration. We always have access to the effective duration if we can perform this repricing exercise. And then finally here, I have the dollar value of the, the price value of basis point or DV01, which just takes the duration, modified duration, multiplies by the price. And when I do that, I'm actually getting what's over here, right, this fraction. I'm getting the uh, dollar duration the, the slope of that uh, uh, secant or tangent line on the price yield curve. Um, and then I divide by 10,000. So I'm rescaling the dollar duration because there are 10,000 basis points in 100%. And so this is telling me that uh, in this situation or in these, set, in these assumptions, the yield uh, shifts down by one basis point, a single basis point. This bond's price increases by uh, 2.71 cents, approximately per the linear approximation, because these are all linear approximations. So that's a comparison of all three, and I hope that's a helpful summary. If this is, subscribe to the channel, and you'll get notified of the next video. Thank you.